Hi everyone. So um, today's reading is going to be from Inside Out and Back Again, and it's going to be pages 1 to 69, which is all of part one. Remember that your assignment is that you are going to read each poem and you're going to create a gist, a one sentence summary that summarizes everything that happened in that one poem. So you're going to give me the title of the poem in quotes, put it in quotes, please. And then underneath just the one to two sentences. These are your notes, so make sure you can read them and don't write down what you think I want to see. Write down what you took away from each poem. So you're going to do that and you're going to have that on your papers and then I'm going to give you a test and you're going to use your notes to fill in the answers. After each of my readings, you might want to hit pause so you can do it and uh, write the gist, but um, enjoy. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, so this is a reading of part one of Inside Out and Back Again. I want to make sure this is on the screen, right? So you guys are kind of stuck with my version of the book where I take notes and I write things down. So um, just bear with me and try to avoid looking at all my little notes. <laughs> so this book was dedicated to the millions of refugees in the world. May you each find a home. Inside Out and Back Again. Part 1, Saigon. We read this in class, but I'm going to go over this one more time. 1975, Year of the Cat. Today is Tet, the first day of the lunar calendar. Every Tet, we eat sugary lotus seeds and glutinous rice cakes. We wear all new clothes, even underneath. Mother warns how we act today, foretells the whole year. Everyone must smile, no matter how we feel. No one can sweep, for why sweep away hope? No one can splash water, for why splash away joy? Today, we all gain one year in age, no matter the date we were born. Tet, our New Year's, doubles as everyone's birthday. Now I'm 10, learning to embroider circular stitches, to calculate fractions into percentages, to nurse my papaya tree to bear many fruits. But last night I pouted when mother insisted one of my brothers must rise first this morning to bless our house because only male feet can bring luck. An old angry knot expanded in my throat and I decided to wake before dawn and tap my big toe to the tile floor first. Not even mother, sleeping beside me, knew. Folks, just so you know, when you see the numbers on the side here, I'm numbering the stanzas. Stanzas are a group of lines, not sentences. So a stanza is everything that kind of looks like a paragraph, even though it's not full of sentences. So there is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve stanzas in this one entry. Okay. Next one. Next poem. Inside Out. Every new year, Mother visits the I Ching teller of fate. This year, he predicts our lives will twist inside out. Maybe soldiers will no longer patrol our neighborhood, and maybe I can jump rope after dark. Maybe the whistles that tell, that tell Mother to push us under the bed will stop screeching. But I heard on the playground that this year's Ban Chung, eaten only during Tet, will be smeared in blood. The war is coming closer to home. Kim Ha. My name is Ha. Brother Quang remembers as I was as red and fat as a baby hippopotamus when he first saw me, inspiring the name Ha Ma, which means river horse. Brother Vu screams Hiya and makes me jump every time. He breaks wood or bricks in imitation of Bruce Lee. Brother Koi calls me mother's tail because I'm always three steps from her. I can't make my brothers go live elsewhere, but I can hide their sandals. We each have but one pair, much needed during this dry season when the earth stings. Mother tells me to ignore my brothers. We named you Kim Ha after the Golden River, where father and I once strolled in the evenings. My parents had no idea what three older brothers can do to the simple name Ha. Mother tells me they tease you because they adore you. She's wrong, but I still love being near her even more than I love my papaya tree. I will offer her its first fruit. Okay, so we already know that um, Kim Ha loves her mother. We know she sleeps with her. We know they're very close with each other. So um, when she says that she's gonna offer her first fruit to her mother, it's a sign of respect. So obviously you're gonna see a lot of my notes and a lot of these questions I probably would have asked you in class, can do now. So after each of these poems, I highly suggest that you just hit pause and um, you do the gists. Papaya tree. It grew from a seed I flicked into the back garden. A seed like a fish eye, slippery, shiny, and black. The tree has grown twice as tall as I stand on tippy toes. Brother Koi spotted the first white blossom. Four years older, he can see higher. 
Brother Vu later found a baby papaya the size of a fist clinging to the trunk. At 18, he can see much higher. Brother Quang is oldest, 21, and studying engineering. Who knows what he'll notice before me. I vow to rise first every morning to stare at the dew on the green fruit shaped like a light bulb. I will be the first to witness its ripening. Titi waves goodbye. My best friend Titi is crying hard, snotting in the hem of her pink fluffy blouse. Her two brothers are also sniffling inside their car, packed to the roof with suitcases. Titi shoves into my hand a tin of flower seeds we gathered last fall. We hope to plant them together. She waves from the back window of their rabbit-shaped car, her tears mixed with long strands of hair, long hair I wish I had. I would still be standing there crying and waving to nothing if Brother Koi hadn't come to take my hand. They're heading to Vung Tao, he says, where the rich go to flee Vietnam on cruise ships. I'm glad we've become poor so we can stay. Missing in action. Father left home on a Navy mission on this day nine years ago when I was almost one. He was captured on Route 1, an hour south of the city, by Moped. That's all we know. This day, Mother prepares an altar to chant for his return, offering fruit, incense, two roses, and glutinous rice. She displays his portrait taken during Tet, the year he disappeared. How peaceful he looks, smiling, peacock tails at the corner of his eyes. Each of us bows and wishes and hopes and prays. Everything on the altar remains for the day except the portrait. Mother locks it away as soon as her chant ends. She cannot bear to look into father's forever young eyes. Long page. Mother's Days. On weekdays, mother is a secretary in a Navy office, trusted to count out salaries and cash at the end of each month. At night, she stays up late designing and cutting baby clothes to give to seamstresses. A few years ago, she made enough money to consider buying a car. On weekends, she takes me to the market stalls, dropping off the clothes and trying to collect on last week's goods. Hardly anyone buys anymore, she says. People can barely afford food. Still, she continues to try. Eggs. Brother Koi is mad at mother for taking his hen's eggs. The hen gives one egg every day and a half. We take turns eating them. Brother Koi refuses to eat his, putting each under a lamp in hopes of a chick. I should side with my most tolerable brother, but I love a soft yolk to dip bread. Mother says if the price of eggs were not the price of rice, and the price of rice were not the price of gasoline, and the price of gasoline were not the price of gold, then of course Brother Koi could continue hatching eggs. She's sorry. Current news. Every Friday in Miss Zinn's class, we talk about current news. But when we keep talking about how close the communists have gotten to Saigon, how much prices have gone up since American soldiers left, how many distant bombs were heard the previous night, Ms. Zinn finally says no more. From now on, Fridays will be for happy news. No one has anything to say. Feel smart. This year I have afternoon classes plus Saturdays. We attend in shifts so everyone can fit into school. Mornings free, mother trusts me to shop at the open market. So last September, she would give me 50 dong to buy 100 grams of pork, a bushel of water spinach, and five cubes of tofu. But I told no one I was buying 99 grams of pork, seven eighths of a bushel of spinach, four and three quarters cubes of tofu. Merchants frowned at mother's strange instructions. The money saved bought a pouch of toasted coconut, one sugary fried dough, and two crunchy mung bean cookies. It now takes 200 dong to buy the same things. I still buy less pork, allowing myself just the fried dough, and no one knows, and I feel smart. Two more papayas. I see them first. Two green thumbs that will grow into orange yellow delights, smelling of summer. Middle sweet between a mango and a pear, soft as a yam gliding down after three easy, thrilling chews. Unknown father. I don't know any more about father other than the small things mother lets slip. He loves stewed eels, pate shod pastries, and of course his children. So much that he grew teary watching us sleep. He hated the afternoon sun, the color brown, and cold rice. Brother Quang remembers father often said to soot, the Vietnamese way to pronounce the French phrase to de sui, meaning right away. Mother would laugh when father followed her around the kitchen repeating, I'm starved for stewed eel, to yet soot, to yet soot. Sometimes I whisper to myself to pretend to know him. 
I would never say Tuyatsut in front of mother. None of us would want to make her sadder than she already is. TV news. Brother Quang raises home, races home from class, throws down his bicycle, exhausted, no longer able to afford gasoline for his moped. Unbelievable, he screams and turns on the TV. A pilot for the South Vietnam bombed the presidential palace downtown that afternoon. Afterward, the pilot flew north and received a medal. The news says the pilot has been a spy for the communists for years. The communists captured father, so why would any pilot choose their side? Brother Quang says one cannot justify war unless each side flaunts its own blind conviction. Since starting college, he shows off even more with tangled words. I start to say so, but mother pats my hand, which is her signal for her, me to calm down. Birthday. I, the youngest, get to celebrate my actual birthday, even though I turned a year older, like everyone else at Tet. I, the only daughter, usually get roasted chicken, dried bamboo soup, and all I can eat pudding. This year, mother manages only banana tapioca and my favorite black sesame candy. She makes up for it for, by allowing one wish. I dye my mouth sugary black and insist on stories. It's not easy to persuade mother to tell of her girlhood in the North, where her grandmother's land stretched farther than doves could fly, where looking pretty and writing poetry were her only duties. She was promised a father at five. They married at 16, earlier than expected. Everyone's future changed upon learning the name Ho Chi Minh. Change meant land was taken away. Houses now belonged to the state. Servants gained power as fighters. The country divided in half. Mother and father came south, convinced it would be easier to breathe away from communism. Her father was to follow, but he was waiting for his son, who was waiting for his wife, who was waiting to deliver a child in its last week in her belly. The same week, North and South closed their doors. No more migration, no more letters, no more family. At this point, mother closes her eyes, eyes that resemble no one else's, sunken and deep like Westerners, yet almond-shaped like ours. I always wish for her eyes, but mother says no. Eyes like hers can't help but carry sadness, even as a child. Her parents were alarmed by the weight in her eyes. I want to hear more, but nothing, not even my pouts, can make mother open her eyes and tell me more. Birthday wishes. Wishes I keep to myself. Wish I could do what boys do and let the sun darken my skin and scars grid my knees. Wish I could let my hair grow, but mother says the shorter the better to beat by Saigon's heat and lice. Wish I could lose my chubby cheeks. Wish I could stay calm no matter what my brothers say. Wish mother would stop chiding me to stay calm, which makes it worse. Wish I had a sister to jump rope with to sew doll clothes and hug for warmth in the middle of the night. Wish father would come home so I can stop daydreaming that he'll appear in my classroom in a white navy uniform and extend his hand toward me for all my classmates to see. Mostly, I wish father would appear in our doorway and make mother's lips curl upward, lifting them from a permanent frown of worries. A day downtown. Every spring, President Thieu holds a long, long, long ceremony to comfort the war wives. Mother and I go because after President Thieu's talk, talk, talk of winning the war, of democracy, of our father's bravery, each family get five, gets five kilos of sugar, 10 kilos of rice, and a small jug of vegetable oil. Inside the cyclo, Mother crosses her legs so I can fit beside her. The breeze is still cool. We bounce across the bridge shaped like a crescent moon where I'm not to go by myself. Mother smells of lavender and warmth. She's so beautiful, even if her cheeks are too hollow, her mouth too dark with worries. Despite warnings, I still want her sunken eyes. Before I see it, I hear downtown thick with beeps, shouts, police whistles everywhere. Mopeds and bicycles race down the wide road, moving out of the way, only when a truck honks and mows straight down in the middle of the lane. We get out in front of an open market. We push our way to a bang corn stand. I love watching the spread of rice flour on cloth stretched over a steaming pot like a magic. A crepe forms to be filled with shrimp and eaten with cucumber and bean sprouts. Bean sprouts. It tastes even better than it looks. While my mouth is full, the noises of the market silence themselves, letting me and my Ben Kwan float. We squeeze ourselves out to, of the market toward the presidential palace. We stand in line for even longer. We sit on hot metal benches facing the podium. 
My white cotton hat and mother's flowery, flowy, flowery, oh my goodness, umbrella are nothing against the afternoon sun, shooting rays into my short hair. I'm dizzy and thirsty, and the fish sauce in the bancon was very salty. My mother gives me a tamarind candy. I've never been so thrilled to drink my saliva. Finally, President Theo appears, tan and sweaty. We know you have suffered. I thank you. Your country thanks you. And then he cries, actual tears, unwiped, facing the cameras. Mother clicks her tongue. Tears of an ugly fish. And I know that to mean the fake tears of a crocodile. Twisting, twisting. Mother measures rice grains left in the bin. Not enough to last till payday at the end of the month. Her brows twist like laundry being wrung dry. Yam and manai could taste lovely blended with rice, she says, and smiles as if I don't know how the poor fill their children's bellies. Close too soon. A siren screams over Miss Zinn's voice in the middle of a lesson on smiley and bald President Ford. We all know it's bad news. School's now closed. Everyone must go home a month too soon. I'm mad and I pinch the girl who shares my desk. Tram is half my size, so skinny and nervous. Our mothers are friends and she'll tell on me. She always tells on me. Mother will again scold me to be gentle. I need time to finish this riddle. A man usually rides his bike nine kilometers per hour, yet the wind slows him to 6.76 kilometers for 26 minutes and 5.55 kilometers for 10. So how long until he gets home 11.54 kilometers away? The first to solve it gets the sweet potato plant sprouting at the window. I want to plant it beside my papaya tree where vines can climb and shade ripening fruit. Again, I pinch tram knowing the plant will be awarded today to the teacher's pet, who is always skinny and nervous and never me. Promises. Five, pap excuse me, papayas the size of my head, a knee, two elbows, and a thumb cling to the trunk. Still green, but promising. Long page. Bridge to the sea. Uncle son, father's best friend, visits us. He's short, dark, and smiley. He's not tall, thin, and serious like father in photographs. Still, when classmates ask about my father, sometimes short and smiley come to mind before I can stop it. Uncle Sun goes straight to the kitchen where the back door opens into an alley. Unbelievable luck. This door bypasses the Navy checkpoint and leads straight to the port. I will not risk fleeing with my children on a rickety boat. Would a Navy ship meet your approval? as if the Navy would abandon its country. There won't be a South Vietnam left to abandon. You really believe we can leave? When the time comes, this house is our bridge to the sea. Should we? Mother calls a family meeting. Ong Zuan has sold leaves of gold to buy 12 airplane tickets. Ba Nam has a van ready to load 25 relatives toward the coast. Mother asks us, should we leave our home? Brother Quang says, how can we scramble away like rats without honor, without dignity, when everyone must help rebuild the country? Brother Koi says, what if father comes home and finds his family gone? Brother Vu says, yeah, we must go. Everyone knows he dreams of touching the same ground where Bruce Lee walked. Mother twists her brows. I've lived in the North. At first, nothing will happen. And then suddenly, Quang will be asked to leave college. Ha will come home chanting the slogans of Ho Chi Minh. And Koi will be reported for rewarding for, oh my goodness, Koi will be rewarded for reporting his teacher everything we say in the house. Her brows twist so much, we hush. Shh. Brother Koi shakes me before dawn. I follow him to the back garden and his palm chirps a downy yellow fuzz just hatched. He presses his palm against my squeal. No matter what mother decides, we are not to leave. I must protect my chick and you, your papayas. He holds out his pinky and stares, stares, stares until I extend mine and we hook. Quiet decision. I help mother peel sweet potatoes to stretch the rice. I start to chop off a potato's end as wide as a thumbnail and then decide to slice off only a sliver. I'm proud of my ability to save until I see tears in mother's deep eyes. You deserve to grow up where you don't worry about saving half a bite of sweet potato. 
early monsoon. We pretend the monsoon has come early. In the distance, bombs explode like thunder, slashes lighten the sky, gunfire falls like rain, distant yet within ears, within eyes, not that far away after all. The president resigns. On TV, President Theo looks sad and yellow. What has happened to his tan? His eyes brimmed with tears, and this time they look real. I can no longer be your president, but I will never leave my people in our country. Mother lifts one brow. What does she think when she thinks I'm lying? Watch over us. Uncle Sun returns and tells us to be ready to leave any day. Don't tell anyone or all of Saigon will storm the port. Only Navy families can board the ships. Uncle Sun and father graduate in the same Navy class. It was mere luck that Uncle Sun didn't go on the mission where father was captured. Mother pulls me close and pats my head. Father watches over us even if he's not here. Mother tells me she and father have a pact. If war should separate them, they know to find each other through father's ancestral home in the north. Crisscross packs. Pedal, pedal, mother's feet push the sewing machine. The faster she pedals, the faster stitches appear on heavy brown cloth. Two rectangles make a pack. A long strip makes a handle to be strapped across the wearer's chest. Hours later, the stitches appear in slow motion. The needle, a worm laying tiny eggs that sink into brown cloth. The tired worm reproduces much more slowly at the end of the day than at the beginning when mother started the first of five bags. Brother Coy says too loudly, make only three. Mother goes to a high shelf, bringing back father's portrait. Come with us or we'll all stay. Think, my son, your action will determine our future. Mother knows this son cannot stand to hurt anyone or anything. Look at father. Come with us so father will be proud. You obeyed your mother while he's not here. I look at my toes, feeling Brother Coy's eyes burn into my scalp. I also feel him slowly nodding. Who can go against a mother who has become gaunt like bark from raising four children alone? Choice. Into each pack. One pair of pants, one pair of shorts, three pairs of underwear, two shirts, sandals, toothbrush, and paste, soap, 10 palms of grain rice, three clumps of cooked rice, one choice. I choose my doll. Once lent to a neighbor who left it outside where mice bit her left cheek and right thumb. I love her more for her scars. I dress her in a red and white dress with matching hat and booties that mother knitted. Left behind. 10 gold rimmed glasses father brought back from America where he trained before I was born. Brother Quang's report cards, each ranking him first in class beginning in kindergarten. Vines in, of bougainvillea and fully in bloom, burgundy and white like the colors of our house. Vines of jasmine in front of every window that remind mother of the North. A cowboy leather belt Brother Vu sewed on mother's sewing machine and broke her needle. That was when he adored Johnny Cash more than Bruce Lee. A row of glass jars, bro jars Brother Coy used to raise fighting fish. Two hooks and the hammock where I nap. Photographs, every Ted at the zoo, father in his youth, mother in her youth, baby pictures, where you can't tell whose bottom is exposed for all the world to see. Mother chooses 10 and burns the rest. We cannot leave evidence of father's life that might hurt him. Wet and crying. My biggest papaya is light yellow, still flecked with green. Brother Vu wants to cut it down, saying it's better than letting the communists have it. Mother says yellow papaya tastes lovely dipped in chili salt. You children should eat fresh fruit while you can. Brother Vu chops, the head falls, the silver blade slices. Black seeds spill like clusters of eyes wet and crying. Sourbacks. At the port, we find out there's no such thing as a secret among the Vietnamese. Thousands found out about the Navy ships ready to abandon the Navy. Uncle Sun flares elbows into wings and lunges forward, protecting his children. But our family sticks together like wet pages. I see nothing but backs, sour and sweaty. Brother Vu steps up, placing mother in front of him and lifting me onto his shoulders. His palms press brothers Quang and Koi forward, and I promise myself to never again make fun of Bruce Lee. One mat each. We climb on and claim a space of two straw mats under the deck, enough for us five to lie side by side. 
By sunset, our space is one straw mat, enough for us five to huddle together. Bodies cram every centimeter below deck, then every centimeter on deck. Everyone knows the ship could sink, unable to hold the piles of bodies that keep crawling on like raging ants from a disrupted nest. But no one is heartless enough to say stop, because what if they had been stopped before their turn? In the dark. Uncle Son visits and whispers to Mother. We follow Mother, who follows Uncle Son, to lead, who leads his family up to the deck and off the ship. It has been said that the ship next door has a better engine, more water, endless fuel, and countless salty eggs. Uncle Son lingers without getting on the new ship, and so do we. Hordes pour by us and beyond us. Above us, bombs pierce the sky. Red and green flares explode like fireworks. All lights are off, so the port will not be a target. In the dark, a nudge here, a nudge there, and we end up back on the first ship in the same spot with two mats. Without lights, our ship glides out to sea, emptied of half of its passengers. Saigon is gone. I listen to the swish swish of mother's handheld fan, the whispers among adults, the bombs in the ever greater distance. The commander has ordered everyone below deck, even though he has chosen a safe river view to connect to the sea. Avoiding the obvious escape path through Vung Tao, where the communists are dropping all the bombs they have left. I hope Titi got out. Mother is sick with waves in her stomach, even though the ship barely creeps along. We hear a helicopter circling and circling near our ship. People run and scream, communists! Our ship dips low as the crowd runs to the left and then to the right. This is not helping Mother. I wish they would all stand still and hush. The commander is talking. Do not be frightened. It's a pilot for our side who has jumped into the water, letting his helicopter plunge in behind him. The pilot, who appears below deck, wet and shaking. He salutes the commander and shouts, At noon today, the communists crashed their tanks through the gates of the presidential palace and planted on the roof a flag with one huge star. Then he adds what no one wants to hear. It's over. Saigon is gone.